All right, time for another video. It's been a while since I've done a project on here. I think since last summer, probably, or into the fall when I did my day gecko enclosure. As I said earlier on, well, I guess I just added the UVB for my boas earlier this year. So in that video, I said, I will slowly be making improvements. I'm not happy with the way I care for my animals. I'm very much interested in continuing to progress my care. And whenever I do make a change for the better, I will bring you guys along. So today I'm gonna make a change in my jungle carpet python enclosure. I only have heat mats in there right now. And I don't have, I do have some lighting, but it's not good lighting. So I wanna add some UVB and I wanna add some proper heat. So if you're not familiar with why heat mats are not the best heating source for your reptile, I will link in below a bunch of different uh, podcast where I discuss different types of heating, but really, really short. Infrared wave, the infrared wavelengths has can be broken up into sort of three separate categories, infrared A, infrared B, and infrared C. Infrared A has some shorter wavelengths and they penetrate much deeper into the body. And that's mostly what the sun is giving us. The sun gives us a lot of infrared A and a lot of infrared B and not very much infrared C. Heat mats only provide infrared C. So I'm not gonna get into a bunch, I'll, I'll link stuff in the description below, but that's what we're gonna change today. And of course I wanna add the lighting as well. I have a couple older UVB bulbs that are not quite extinguished, so they'll still have some UV and then I'm gonna order some fresh ones for him as well. But here's the issue. You guys saw me build this cage out of old windows. I did that for my originally for my Brazilian rainbow boa when it was in sort of the landscape orientation. And then I converted it to a jungle carpet python enclosure by adding all these extra climbing branches and whatnot. This top is glass. There's no screen, nothing on the top. And to add lighting in here, of course, I basically need to take the top off. I could have put lighting in there, but Everything is way too close to the ceiling, so this needs to come off. I need to screen the top, and then I can have lighting on top. So that is what we're doing today. And right now, I'm just in the process of slowly cutting this off with a blade, and uh, it's not gonna be super exciting to watch. So once I get it off, we will return, uh, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. All right, now the lid is completely off, so I have a nice big gaping hole on the top, so now we can replace it. So I'll show you, I built this little wooden frame here and that's going to wrap around the perimeter. I'm gonna paint it black, it's gonna wrap around the perimeter and then there's gonna be screen inside there. I really wanted to go with that sort of vinyl mesh, those little square uh, sort of roll up fence mesh but I cannot find any in my city. It's sold out completely across. I think COVID is really slowing things down. So I ended up going just with regular aluminum screen. I'll show you guys that in a second. And I'll show you, I'm no carpenter. This is, I had to do this all by hand with one of those miter boxes. I have no tools. So I just wanna show you guys how bad this is and show you that you can do it as well because all I did is, is I cut these 45 degree angles. I put no more nails in between and then a couple of staples just to hold it through. It's just drying right now. And it looks okay, but you can see I have one corner that of course like, the little bit of error on each one of these corners adds up to a pretty major error in the corner, but I'm gonna put this in the back. You're never gonna see it. I'm gonna paint it black. You're probably not gonna see that at all. So I just wanna show you guys, if you are not handy, there's a lot of ways to hide your mistakes so no one else will see them but you. All right, so there is the frame. It's completely painted now. Again, it doesn't look super great, but it'll do perfectly fine for now. So now that it is basically dry, I have aluminum screen just like this. I'm gonna fill this hole I'm gonna need a hand, I need to get Sam in a second. I'm gonna use the screen, I'm just gonna staple it in that way and it's still gonna look a little bit kind of not that nice and I'll show you how I'm gonna clean it up in a second, but that is the next step, stapling the screen. Again, this is not the screen that I wanted, but it will be okay for now. Okay, so the screen is installed. I know it's really rough right now, especially around the edges. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be getting any calls from Exoterra anytime soon to teach them how to install screens, but we are going to clean this up. I'm going to show you how. So I just have these little sort of finishing boards that are going to get screwed on here and they're going to cover up the edge, but also more importantly, they're going to seal off that screen and they're going to hold it in place so it can't go anywhere. Staples aren't really the best for holding in screens because they can rip and the screen is flexible and there's going to be some weight on the screen because of the lighting and whatnot. Uh, so we do want to make sure that it's held in nice and tight. So I'm just gonna put that there and just screw it in place.
All right, so now I have these strips on, the screen is held in place, and arguably I'd say it looks even worse now, but that is okay. I think, I don't know if I've said, the product that I'm using is No More Nails. I like this product because it does stick, things stick really, or it holds things together really, really well, but also it, it lets off no fumes, so it doesn't take any time. Once it's dry, you can't even smell it. Even when you're applying it, you can't smell it. But the other cool thing about it is, you can paint right over it once it's dry, and uh, we're gonna do that right now. So we'll go from this to this. All right, so there we go. There. The lid is just sitting on top of the enclosure now. So you can see from in there and from above, obviously this is gonna apply or give way more ventilation, which is something that I wanted to add to this enclosure anyway. And now we can get some proper lighting. And this, this screen is really nice and tight. It, it would take a lot of force to, to pop that off. So that should be perfectly secure. Now the next step for me is figuring out a way to actually secure the lid to the enclosure. Obviously right now it's just sitting there like this. I'm going to throw a few screws down in the front because I have some wood here that is connected to the enclosure so that will screw it in. And honestly, for the rest, I'm honestly just gonna use Gorilla, gorilla Tape. It's and it, like black Gorilla Tape, so it should blend in. You shouldn't be able to see it. I would normally use silicone and silicone it in, but this is inside my reptile room right now. I wanna get the Python back in here as soon as possible. Silicone takes forever to gas off and I don't really need it. The tape will be more than secure. As long as it blends in with this black stripe, I don't think it's gonna be a problem uh, looks wise. And of course it won't it won't go anywhere. Grill glue or Gorilla tape is extremely strong and it's, it's it's a good solution for a temporary solution anyway, something that I'll have to fix eventually in the future, but for now it'll be totally fine. All right, three screws in, one, two, three. So that's actually screwed right into the base. And then there's the tape. So an end doesn't look amazing, but it kind of, it actually blends in pretty well with the rest of the enclosure. So, and it is on really well. You cannot lift this off. So pretty happy with that. Okay, so real quick, I just want to explain to you the two lights that I'm going to have on this enclosure now. So up until this point, again, I didn't really have any lighting. I had just this, uh, what is it? Zoomed or something, just little LED thing. It's not very good. Uh, I have very, very weak lights. And then I just had the, the heat tape. So I had heat tape in the back at the top to create some ambient temperatures in the top. And then a heat mat at the bottom for a one hot spot. I have removed all the heat mat and heat tape from the top of the enclosure. I think I'm still gonna keep the one on the bottom just for now. Uh, I'll see, I'll, I may end up taking it out uh, eventually, but for now, I have these two lights. So I have a T8 Arcadia 12%, which is probably way higher than you would normally do for carpet python, but this is actually about 10 months old, this bulb. I was using it on my day gecko enclosure and I switched her to a T5, so I had this one kicking around. It probably has a little bit of UV left in it. Um, maybe not though, that's why I do need to pick up a solar meter, but this is set up for him to have proper UV. So I will end up buying him a fresh bulb at some point soon, but I suspect there is still some UV in this bulb. Uh, you also have to remember that the screen is going to block out probably almost half of the UV. This screen is, like I said, I didn't really want this screen because it's very small grid and it's gonna bounce back a lot of the light. So that's unfortunate. So 12% plus it being weak is probably okay. Plus it's a very tall enclosure. And then for heat at the top, I have just a 50 watt flood halogen bulb. So again, this is gonna be full of infrared with a little bit of, or infrared A with a little bit of infrared B and is gonna be just a, a much more natural light and way healthier for the carpet python. So that covers the UV and the light. So the way I'm gonna control this bulb is obviously you still wanna use a thermostat, but you can't use an on off thermostat for a bulb because it's just gonna be constantly turning the bulb on and off, which is uh, not ideal. So I'm gonna kind of cheat. Typically you'd wanna use a dimming thermostat. I don't have a dimming th thermostat right now. Eventually that's something I'm gonna uh, eventually pick up. They are very expensive. Well, I shouldn't say they're very expensive. They're definitely worth the money. I just need a better setup. Once I have everything set up in a way I want it, I'll invest in a better thermostat system. But for now, this is what I'm gonna do. So I have a dimming outlet or a, an outlet dimmer right here. So this will allow me to control the power of the bulb. And I'm going to set it up. I'm gonna leave it for a few hours and I'm gonna find the setting on this dimmer that will give me that sort of 88 90 degree hot spot. Now, most people will say that it's not adequate, and I agree, it's not 100% adequate because if the room temperature increases, obviously the hot spot's gonna increase. That's only maintaining, like I'll set up the hot spot now, my room is 27 degrees Celsius, but if it drops down to 22 degrees Celsius in here, which it does all the time, then that hot spot's not gonna be accurate. And of course, if it goes up to 30 degrees Celsius, then the hot spot's gonna be too hot. So I'm gonna use this to control the temperature, but then I'm also gonna have a thermostat probe, an on-off thermostat probe that's gonna be set a few degrees higher than I would ever want the, the 
hot spot to ever get. So it'll be more of a sail, a, a fail safe. So I'll have it quite a bit hotter than a normal hot spot. I might let it get to maybe like 96 degrees before it flicks off, which would be very difficult for it to do while it's on dim. That would only really happen if there's a spike in room temperature. And again, 96 with this is a three foot tall enclosure. There's tons of space, a 96 degree hot spot on occasion would still not be the worst thing. It's not what I would recommend for a carpet python, obviously, but if it did get to that point, the thermostat would kick in and it would kill the kill it. And then of course that would shut off the light, which would be a little bit annoying, but ideally we don't have to rely on the thermostat at all. So that's sort of my way of getting around not having a dimming, th a dimming thermostat on hand. Hopefully that makes sense. So we'll set up the probe. I'll show you where it's gonna go and then we'll turn on the lights. All right, so hopefully that was making sense what I was explaining there regarding the temperature control for this bulb. I just realized that I'm bouncing between Fahrenheit and Celsius, so I apologize for that. That's sort of the issue with living in Canada. All my reptile things are in Fahrenheit, but I keep my room temperatures and everything in Celsius. So we're gonna, the bulb is gonna have main intensity right here, kind of on this perch, as well as in this area. So I'm just gonna get the probe and just fix it to that spot right there. And again, this is going to be the fail safe. So it gets to a few degrees warmer than I want the hot spot. It's going to kill the bulb. It will turn the bulb off, which is not ideal. Obviously, you don't want the bulb strobing throughout the day. Again, this would only be a fail safe if, for whatever reason, the room temperature spikes. All right, let's get these lights on. So there's the halogen, and I already know that it's going to be a little bit too strong. So I'm going to dim it a little bit. Oh, that wasn't even on full. So that's full, that's dim. So we'll start with it somewhere around there. See what temperatures that get us. Again, I'm not throwing the animal in yet. We've got to play around with things first. And then here's the UV. And there we go. That is much better. So I have to say, I'm pretty happy with this enclosure. As if you remember, I built this enclosure by hand out of old windows. This, this is all old windows that I found and I've turned it into an enclosure. It's had many different iterations and now this is probably my favorite. I've just, of course, adding proper lighting makes everything so much better. And I added this uh, marble pothos in there as well. It's probably gonna be annoying because it's pretty big. It takes up a lot of the floor space and his warm hide is back there. But at the same time, I love having live plants. I've had this little one in there for a while now, but this is gonna help with the humidity and just give some more enrichment for him and, and whatnot. So, so my office slash podcast studio is now a complete disaster, of course, but I'm very happy with being able to make that upgrade today again. So now everybody has UV except for my Brazilian rainbow bowl. I still have to figure out this enclosure is not the best for adding electronics into. So I have to figure out what to do there. Everybody has UV, crested geckos, boas, now the carpet python. Everybody has live plants as well now, which is awesome. So again, it's about making these slow improvements, smooth, slowly progressing the care into something better and better and better. Really the only enclosure that I'm super proud of right now is my day gecko enclosure right here. And I spent a lot of time and really a lot of money making this. My plants are starting to suffer. I have to figure something out there. There she is just hanging out on her basking spot. She's basking under her jungle dawn there. I'm happy with this enclosure. I spent tons of time building this one and sort of thinking of it from the ground up. Unlike the rest of my animals and probably like you as well, you may have gotten an animal before planning for it. And that's sort of what I did. I bought more animals than I could afford to keep them properly. And now that I've realized that over the past two years, I'm slowly improving the care and I hope that you are encouraged to do the same. So very happy with this. Next steps, UV there, and actually there's gonna be makeovers all over the place. Now, let's look at the carpet python because I'm sure you guys wanna see him. I just have him in this little box here while we do his work. So this, I mean, look at that snake. That's an amazing snake. And he's gonna look even better under the new lights, especially that UV bulb is gonna bring out his yellows. The reason he looks so good right now is because he's sitting underneath the day gecko enclosure with the jungle dawn and uh, it looks pretty amazing. So that's awesome. I don't think I'm gonna add him in just yet. I wanna keep that enclosure kind of testing it for a while. Plus I should probably leave it at least a day cause I did paint. Although I just used a very non-toxic like children's acrylic paint. There's no smell or anything, but I'll give it a day and then tomorrow I'll add him. But of course I'll show that in this video. All right, so it is the next morning. It's only about maybe 8.20 in the morning, so the lights have not come on. And as you guys know, I have a sort of simulated sunrise in my day, go, day gecko enclosure. The rest of the lights are still off. The effect doesn't work quite as well in the summer because the, of course, it's complete daylight right now. In the winter, it's great because 
it's pitch black here until about 8 30 in the morning anyway but uh, whatever i'll keep the blinds closed so with the the carpet python i'm going to do something sort of similar i have the halogen coming on first so it's Again, the effect doesn't look great right now because there's a lot of other sort of diffused light in the room, but the halogen will come on for maybe an hour or so before the UV. So it sort of starts to simulate a bit of a sunrise and I'm just kind of still testing temperatures. I'm not gonna add the carpet python just yet, but I thought I would share that with you guys as well. And the other thing that I did this morning, of course, I'm just tinkering around with things, waiting until I add the, the snake. I ended up deciding that I would keep the heat mat in the bottom, but what I decided to do is I have it on a timer. So the timer ranges, it, it comes on at around three in the afternoon and turns off at around one in the morning, which is a very unusual time or, you know, a timing interval to have heating come on. And I'll explain why that is. And I'm pretty, you know, it's exciting. It's one more way to make the environment a little bit more natural. So. As I said earlier in the video, the sun gives us a lot of infrared A and a little bit of infrared B and very, very little infrared C. Heat mats and radiant heat panels and things like that or heat cable really own or they only output infrared C. And again, I don't want to get too deep into this. I'll link a bunch of videos for you to watch if you want to have a further explanation of that. But the sun does not give us any infrared C. It does a little bit, but very not very much. Most of the infrared C wavelengths in our environment come off of the earth. So you can imagine the sun comes down, heats up a rock. As the heat comes off the rock, it's lost some energy, so now it's coming off in infrared C wavelengths. So that's what I'm trying to simulate with this heat mat on the bottom. So the heat mat's on the bottom, I'm imagining that's sort of like a rock in the environment for my snake. So it will take about till one in the afternoon or two in the afternoon for the sun to really put some temperature into that rock. The rock is heating up, and now it's gonna start pushing off that infrared C wavelengths, which is a very, very natural thing to happen in the environment. But of course, it will not continue to do that through the entire night, because as soon as the sun goes down, the rock is gonna start cooling. So I have it clicking on in the afternoon as if it were a rock that has now come to a high temperature or warm temperature in the sun, and it will maintain that heat, and then by around midnight or so, the heat from the sun is gone and it'll slowly lose temperature throughout the rest of the night, where in the morning it will be completely, you know, room temperature or whatever temperature the, the air is without the sun. So hopefully that makes sense. So as soon as the heat pad clicks off at around one in the morning or so, it will probably have maybe an hour or so of re residual heat that will be slowly dissipating throughout the rest of the evening. So there'll be a couple hours of no heat at all. And this should encourage him that when he wakes up in the morning, his body temperature will be lower. And if he is in the bottom hind, it should encourage him to climb up to the top and get some of that warm halogen bulb, which is much more representation or a much better representation of the sun with the high levels of infrared A. So hopefully that makes sense. I thought it was just kind of a cool way to incorporate a heat mat into an environment to sort of simulate some natural behaviors or some natural elements of the wild. Okay, so the dimmer is now set at a spot that's perfect. It's midday. It's been on all day. That hot spot's sitting right around 88 to 90 degrees. What I do is I'm going to use a piece of masking tape to tape the dimmer just so it doesn't get slid. It's, those things are very easy to slide. So it's good to use tape and hold it in that position so it doesn't move. Again, that only somewhat controls the temperature. The thermostat will be the fail safe. If it gets to 94 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll just turn off the light, which shouldn't really happen pretty much ever again, unless we have a spike in room temperature. Okay, so we're going to add him in now. I think he's ready to go. All right, so I just wanted to spend a couple minutes here discussing this tub. Now, this is the tub that I put all my snakes in while I'm cleaning their cages. Now, Somebody might argue that this is the standard for keeping your snakes. We see a lot of snakes in tubs. Maybe this would be a little bit smaller than they might recommend, but the basic setup, add a water dish and a heat mat in here, and that's what you're talking about. Um, personally, I think if you have the opportunity to keep a snake, why keep it in something where I'm not gonna be able to see it act out its natural behaviors? This is an arboreal snake. I wanna see it climb trees. I wanna see it explore. I wanna see it, it perched up. And in, in, even if I stuck a little perch in here, it's not gonna be nearly as exciting as it's going to be in this enclosure. So again, I, I'm not, I've talked a lot about the industrialized style of care and of course I'm not for it. And this is exactly why I own this snake because I wanna see what this snake acts like in the wild. He's not gonna do anything in this tub besides curl up in his hide under his heat mat and that's basically it. So let's get him in his new cage. He's a little bit flighty so he can be kind of, he'll probably go cruising around quite fast once we get him in there. He's sometimes a little bit bitey. Come here, buddy. Okay. Let me see if I can get some good shots of him before I put him in there. Wait. 
Okay, so he has been in that tub without heat all night, so he's definitely cold. So let's see how he reacts to the heat. Just wanna move you guys a little closer. All right, so as he explores his new lighting and new plant and whatnot, I thought I would just finish this video off with just doing a really quick peaceful rant. And I wanna just explain a couple of things. I think a really interesting point to make is now that he has this halogen bulb, which is producing infrared A wavelengths, he is gonna feel warm for the first time in his life. Now that seems like a pretty extreme statement, but this is a snake that came from a breeder from a racking system. When he was with me, he had his quarantine tub and then this enclosure, which was all heated through heat tape and heat mats. And as I said, those only produce infrared C wavelengths. Infrared C does not penetrate past the skin. So you're warming the skin, you're warming the area around the animal, but you're not warming its deep tissue. It's not penetrating through the muscles into the organs and actually warming the animal internally. So I think an easy example would be if you imagine yourself inside, maybe you're inside your house or your apartment and it's 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a pretty comfortable range. You can be sitting maybe in sweatpants even, you're, you're not going to be overly hot. But if you go outside and it's 22 degrees or 20 or 72 degrees Fahrenheit and you're standing in the sun, you will start to feel warm. You'll start to feel that tingly feeling on your skin and you'll get a lot warmer than you would if you were inside. The reason for that is because you're not being bombarded by infrared A and infrared B when you're inside. It's just the ambient room temperature that's keeping you warm, but the infrared wavelengths aren't penetrating into your skin or through your skin into your muscle tissue and warming you up from the inside. Now for humans, we are endothermic animals, which means we can be inside and we can maintain our body temperature no problem. And even the fact that we're not getting exposed to infrared wavelengths, we're not gonna necessarily feel it. I'm not recommending that because we do know that infrared wavelengths are incredibly health beneficial. That's one of the reasons why saunas are so popular in the health and wellness industry. But because we make our own body heat, we can sit inside and not necessarily realize that we're lacking infrared A. Now imagine being ectothermic, like a reptile. All reptiles, of course, are cold-blooded. They do not produce their own body heat. They are at the mercy of the environment to maintain their body temperature. So this entire life of this python, he's two years old, he's only been exposed to temperatures that are warming his skin, but not actually warming deep into his body. So it's really tough to imagine what that must be like. If you can't produce, imagine if you, I mean, it's impossible to imagine, but imagine you couldn't produce your own body temperature and then you were in a room that was 22 degrees. You're gonna be really, really cold. But again, you go outside and sit in the sun, you're gonna warm up. The halogen is offering the same thing that, or as close as we can right now that the sun would offer the animal. Allow them to deeply penetrate, or the, the heat to deeply penetrate their body and actually warm them. Doesn't matter how long you sit on a heat mat or heat tape, it's never going to happen. It's the wrong wavelength of energy. So I've been trying to come up with some kind of analogy for us endotherms to understand what it might be like for an ectotherm. And it is tough because it's, I mean, we're always, our body temperature is always being maintained. It's really hard to think that what it would be like to have the environment dictate that. But imagine you may have had a friend or a family member that's done this. They go on an extremely calorically restricted diet. Maybe they're trying to lose weight or get fit or something and they're not eating enough or what I would consider not eating enough and they're hungry all the time. But one thing that will happen when you go on a cal calorically restricted diet is you get cold. People that go on those types of diets, maybe you've done one yourself, your feet get cold, your hands get cold. You're not giving your body enough energy to make the heat that it requires to maintain our body temperatures. Of course, it's our metabolism that keeps our, our body temperature up. We're eating all this food and that's what we use to produce body heat. When someone does not eat enough, their feet get cold, their hands get cold, the blood is shunting away from their extremities in towards the organs. That cold feeling that you get when you're in one of those states, like doesn't matter how many blankets you put on, you're still cold, is what it must be like for a reptile to be only exposed to infrared C. You're not quite getting that deep, soothing sensation of heat that you're just desiring. I don't know if that's a great analogy, but I think it does enough to really make you understand how important it is to have that heat. They can't produce their own heat or they cannot produce their own body heat, which means we want to replicate the sun as best we can. It's actually a little bit sad to think that he's been robbed of that for his entire life. So I want to make it clear that this rant is not about me saying, hey, if you keep your snakes on a heat mat or heat tape, then you're a bad keeper. Because guess what? I have four snakes. Three of them are on heat tape or heat mats. They don't have any infrared light. So 
this is just me saying, hey, this is one way you can improve. And eventually my goal is to improve the other snakes as well. I just have to make some enclosure modifications and whatnot, but it's on my to-do list. And I'm hoping that maybe this video will inspire you to do the same. Maybe if you have three or four snakes, maybe you can spend the next month or so figuring out how to get infrared A and infrared B wavelengths into that snake's enclosure. If you, again, if you're looking for way more information on proper heating and everything, I'm gonna link a bunch of things in the description below. And if you really want, I can't recommend this book enough, Fire by John Courtney Smith. He's been on my podcast as well. Uh, there's two episodes now. And this podcast or this book breaks down everything you need to know about heating and lighting. And that is really the best source you can get for light. But there are plenty of videos out there that I will link that will give you a good rough you know, breakdown of the type of lighting you can get to supply the proper type of heat. Pretty interesting to see him sitting right there. So he's kind of on this middle perch. I think it's probably around 80 degrees there, maybe 78, 79, but the infrared wavelengths are still gonna be hitting him and he'll actually warm up in that spot. So again, I, I thank you very much for watching this video. Hopefully it was a little bit informative and you found some, some new information out. If we can do our best to replicate the natural environment, then we should. And the sun is a huge part of these animals' environments. Even though this is a nocturnal animal, basking in the sun is an absolute requirement for, for these animals to live. And this is what I'm providing him now. All right, I will see you guys in the next video or podcast.